chat by saying it out loud. Oh, thank you. And it's okay to moderate how much you want to interact. Can you, you can come and get this, please? That's totally okay. Oh, could you please meet your mic? Thank you. If anyone has uh, access requests that would support your participation in this call, no problem. <laughs> um, if anyone has uh, a request for access needs or um, would like support with your participation in this call or with us more generally, uh, we'd like to invite you to share via chat, either privately to me or one of the co-hosts um, of the group. So that would be Sarah or Lois. If you are up, um, if you are up for it and could also share your name, organization, and current location in the chat while we get going. And thanks everyone for being here. I'm gonna to continue to let folks in as they arrive. Um, so here's our agenda. Today we're going to uh, give a quick update on the APGP timeline, give a quick overview of the adaptation pl planning program itself, and then have a presentation from our technical assistance provider, Civics, on application budget and work plans. We will save uh, the end of today's session for a Q&A. So if you have any sort of burning questions that arise during the, um, during the presentation, we encourage you to jot them down um, and save them for the end if you would like a response um, from one of us. Uh, or feel free to put the question in the chat if you don't feel like speaking, and uh, we'll get to your question at the end. Uh, for the Q&A, uh, if you have technical questions regarding your project specifically, we recommend that you follow up with us via email or attend office hours, um, though we hope the Q&A session today uh, can remain broad broadly applicable and hopefully address some of your questions. Um, as you just heard, we're going to be recording the session and it will be available upon request. We'll also um, be posting it on our website shortly after the session. Hopefully this week, fingers crossed. Next slide, please. So um, the Adaptation Planning Grant Program pre-application interest form and main application form, uh, they have been extended. Those due dates have been extended. So the pre-application interest form is now due at midnight on May 20th. So 11.59 p.m. on May 20th. The pre-application forms are not scored. Um, as a friendly reminder. And then the round two main application form has now been extended to 11.59 p.m. on June 3rd. So this represents um, roughly a two week extension. So hopefully um, folks who were nervous about the previous deadline um, have a little bit more wiggle room there. And we're really encouraging with this extension that all interested applicants, please, take advantage of this extension to thoroughly review your application, um, review the adaptation planning grant requirements as outlined in the guidelines and really uh, heed the, the, um, the guidance that we provide here in these workshops that you'll hear later from civics. Next slide, please. So this is a quick look at what the timeline looks like now. So you'll see we launched the application period on February 16th. The request for technical assistance priority deadline was March 18th. That has since passed. And the pre-application interest form is now due May 20th. And the, and the main application form is now due on June, June 3rd at midnight. So hopefully giving folks a nice chunk of time to continue that work. So um, we now have two additional office hours as a result of this extension. So through May 30th, we will continue to host virtual office hour sessions uh, weekly on Thursdays from 1 to 2 p.m. to answer applicant questions. Um, there are seven of these office hours um, left, so plenty of opportunities for folks to you know, develop questions, ask those questions. Um, and attend. We host them. They're a full hour long. We'd love to see folks uh, register in advance so we can get a sense of, you know, how many folks are going to be uh, attending. And then we also have a, a waiting room policy. So it's first come, first serve. 
we give folks about 10 to 15 minutes, um, depending on the volume of folks. If it's packed, we'll have to strict uh, adhere to those timelines and, and those uh, minimum thresholds or maximum thresholds. And then, of course, if there's not that many folks, we can give folks a little bit extra time to ask those questions. Um, I will add the link to office hours here in the chat. That way everyone has access. Thanks everyone for giving, sharing your name and where you're calling from. Great, and uh, now I'll give a quick grant program overview for those who may not be as familiar. We, um, well, today we're focused on the Adaptation Planning Grant Program. I wanted to share briefly uh, an overview of the three programs under the ICART por portfolio, especially since the HEAT Program Round 1 and Adaptation Planning Grant Program Round 2 will overlap. Um, next slide, please. Great. The Regional Resilience Grant Program uh, aims to support local, regional, and tribal entities, regional scale climate resilience solutions. They just awarded $21 million to 16 projects starting this year. The Extreme Heat and Community Resilience Program will fund planning and implementation projects to reduce the impacts of extreme heat and build community resilience. The program will build frameworks for change and invest in local, regional, and tribal projects that strengthen communities that are vulnerable to heat. And then the Adaptation Planning Grant Program, which is why we're here today, supports local, regional, and tribal communities engaging in integrated climate adaptation planning. I will add some links to those other programs in the chat as well, if you would like to check them out. Great, next slide, please. So the Adaptation Planning Grant Program, or APGP, is an initiative with multiple rounds of funding to support local, regional, and tribal adaptation planning efforts in the face of climate change. In round one, we successfully awarded approximately $8 million to 14 incredible projects. And the grants ranged from $150,000 to $650,000, which reflects the diversity and scale of the initiative supported through the Adaptation Planning Grant Program. Looking ahead to round two, we are excited to announce $9.5 million in available funding scheduled for early 2024. One of the great advantages of the APGP is that no match funding is required. We understand the challenges of our communities uh, what they face, and we want to make the process as accessible as possible. So just understanding that communities have not always had equal access to uh, state funding, especially funding related to um, climate change. Secondly, this round, we have technical assistance. So um, you'll see a presentation from our technical assistance providers here today. And we also have advanced payment available for qualifying entities. Next slide, please. So uh, our next slide, and I think this is the last slide before we get into the budget work plan presentation, is on eligible applicants and activities. For eligible applicants, local public entities, um, well, let me let someone in real quick. For eligible applicants, we have local public entities, California Native American tribes, Community-based organizations, including but not limited to 501c3 nonprofit organizations, non-governmental organizations, philanthropic organizations, foundations, and other organizations with a history of representing vulnerable communities. Ineligible applicants include for-profit entities, state agencies, um, and there should be a minimum of one co-applicant in addition to the lead applicant. Um, more than one applicant, uh, more than one co-applicant, sorry, is encouraged. And um, we have for eligible activities, we're really emphasizing planning. So planning activities can be uh, quite broad from the initial visioning of uh, a project through the vulnerability assessments, 
um, through uh, finalizing the plans and creating next steps for how to implement the project, the plan. Um, we have more information on eligible planning activities in the California Adaptation Planning Guide, um, which I will share a link in the chat. And then in ineligible activities include implementation or construction projects and CEQA and NEPA activities broadly. And then finally, our key program priorities. Uh, APGP aims to foster inclusivity and flexibility in climate adaptation planning. Key goals for the program include to enhance accessibility and diversity, minimizing barriers for diverse applicants, ensuring geographic, economic, and demographic representation, uh, prioritizing vulnerable communities through adopting an all-risk approach for various climate impacts, encouraging community preparedness for cascading climate impacts, emphasizing integrated infrastructure planning through focusing on social and physical infrastructure and integration, as well as addressing cross-sector issues related to climate risk, to build community resilience through enhancing statewide capacity through technical support and peer learning, as well as empowering communities for effective climate adaptation. And then finally, to elevate equity in planning. So we're really focused on prioritizing fair access and directing funding to disadvantaged communities by supporting projects that address historical disparities with the ultimate goal to create a more equitable and resilient future for all. Uh, really appreciate y'all's attention there for the quick overview of the Adaptation Planning Grant program. If you have any follow-up questions, uh, please do not hesitate to ask or email myself. This is a quick look at the timeline. So right now we are in the application window and we're hoping to award um, announce awards here in the summer. Um, so really looking forward to y'all's uh, commitment through the, the application um, development phase. And with that, I will hand it over to Lois from Civics to give a quick presentation on budget and work plan. All right, I'm gonna, let's see, this was fun. Yes, I'm gonna share my screen. Hello, everybody. I am Lois Colson with Civics with an X, um, in case you wanna Google us. Uh, providing technical assistance uh, both to the extreme heat and our RPG and AD APGP. So excited to be here. Let's see. You're seeing my title slide, I hope, and not notes, right? Yes. Okay. Just the slide. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're going to focus on two of the components, required components today for your application. Um, they're in, they're uh, provided to you as in a template form in what is called the project workbook. Um, we're gonna go over the workbook real quick and then we'll dive into the details on the work plan and the budget itself. And we'll save room for questions um, at the end. And I should mention that this is being recorded and it will be posted, correct, Brandon, on the, on the APGP page? Correct. For later viewing, yep. Uh, so if I'm going fast, it's just because I want to leave some time at the end for your your questions. That's usually where we get into a lot of um, the the relevant stuff for you all that you really want to know about. Um, I'm just going to give you an overview. So starting with the project workbook, which again is just the the document that houses the work plan and the budget, and it's provided to you through the submittable main application. Um, once you get into that submittable, if you haven't been in there yet, the link to download the workbook is sort of towards the end. You'll scroll down and it's in that big red font that you see on the right side of the screen there. You're downloading that project workbook. Um, when it opens up, it's an Excel worksheet or workbook, I should say. And then it has different tabs, which are also shown under that second bullet point. I'm a visual person, so I tried to take a lot of screenshots and pull them over. 
Uh, so when you open that workbook, you'll see at the bottom, you have um, five tabs. The work plan and the budget are the first ones, and those are basically templates. And ICARP staff has done an awesome job to literally just spoon feed you and tell you like, this is what we need to know, fill in these blanks, um, and you'll be in good shape. Um, so we're going to talk about that. Um, it also includes, uh, the workbook also includes examples for both the budget and the work plan. Uh, and a reference uh, tab that we're going to talk about in a little bit more detail. So let's talk about the work plan first um, and just give you some context about why you were having to fill this out and, and how it's helping um, ICARP review your application. It's really helpful for the reviewers to um, boil down your all your narrative responses into this same format so they can make sure and look at it and to see the discrete tasks and the detailed deliverables that you're going to do with your project. It also demonstrates for them how um, your activities align with the required components. Um, and how you are thinking about the priorities that are in the project um, or the grant program's vision and goals. Uh, so it's just demonstrating that you're following along and that you're meeting um, the requirements and the requests that, that ICARP has set out. Um, the work plan is also going to identify, excuse me, <laughs> uh, tasks and break them out down into subtasks. Uh, and into timelines, and also going to point out the different partners that are going to be included um, in your activities. Um, just the next couple slides here are going to talk about some things to consider when you're thinking about your work plan and when you're looking at it. Um, as I mentioned, you want to make sure that all of your activities that make up your entire scope of work are broken down and included on the work plan. You don't want to leave anything out. Uh, you also want to make sure that everything you're putting in there can be completed in the 24-month grant period timeline um, that comes up under the work plan and in the budget. Uh, you must uh, clearly describe your tasks. Um, it's The template is going to pull out the milestone, ask you to you know, describe the milestones uh, and the timelines as well, and the partners. Um, so when you look at the template, and we, we will look at it here when we do a walkthrough in a little bit, um, you're you're going to, they'll give you some prompts in the templates, but you're thinking about like, how how am I going to complete this task and what does that deliverable look like? That's a really important part of the work plan. Some other things to consider uh, is your partners that are involved. What is their expertise and what are, where play to their strengths? So include them on your work plan, especially if you have committed partners, you wanna make sure and show how they're fitting into your scope of work and where they're gonna play a role. Um, and ensure, this is a big one, it's in the middle, it's the second uh, bullet, but it's kind of repeated in various places throughout uh, this conversation and in the guidelines, just ensuring that your tasks on the work plan are tied back to your narrative responses um, and to your budget. Those three things all need to align. You don't wanna have an activity described in your narrative response and not mentioned anywhere on your work plan and or your budget. Um, and then the other thing is, I think uh, Brandon mentioned early, you know, some of you may not have looked at it yet, and that's fine. Um, I would highly recommend that you look at it early. You don't have to fill anything out right away, but just get familiar with it and what the questions are, what you're what you're going to be completing before you submit, because then that helps you while you're thinking of your narrative responses, understand like, okay, this is going to have to go in my workplace in that tab or that, um, you know, that column or that field that I saw when I looked at it the first time. And you're going to come back and it's going to be iterative. As your narrative responses or your scope of work might be tweaked a little bit, you might need to add something or clarify something in your work plan. So it's not a one and done thing. Download it early, look at it, play with it, do a draft, um, and you can always come back to it before you submit it. And then this is the last uh, sort of key considerations for the work plan. Uh, I wanted to pull this out. Appendix C is in the guidelines and it's basically, I think the title of it is tips for a successful APGP uh, application. And one of the tips, number four in particular, talks about how you know it, it gives you the tip to integrate the equity checklist into your work plan. So I thought that was particularly relevant here and a, and a really great point that could easily be missed because it is, um, you know, number four on this list of like the third appendix, right? Now, OPR has provided an equity checklist. Um, that link is actually in Appendix D. 
Um, it's also linked here, but I'm not sure if that will work once the recording is put up. But um, I wanted to point that out and it's a great way you could include the equity checklist on your work plan. And it's already pretty much done for you. Um, and then also referring to another thing to consider and keep in mind is that um, there's an example of the work plan. And we're gonna look at that one a little bit more when we walk through, but the example is super helpful to give you um, more insight into what it should look like in the end. Um, these are just some common questions that we've heard come up already about the work plan or maybe ones that I had myself. Uh, there is a column in the work plan about which partners are involved. I mentioned this already. Um, so if you're awarded, uh, your partners can also be engaged during the grant term period. Uh, so if you have partners that are not yet, you're not at a place yet where you're going to be able to sign an agreement right away, or you don't know if it's going to be an agreement, but you're still working through it, just make sure that's clear in your narrative response when it comes to the question about partnerships um, and community collaboration. And you can still include them on your work plan as the potential role that this partner may play. Um, but for those of you that will have partnership agreements, you already know who they're going to be, make sure you identify them um, on your work plan. Um, so the, the point, the takeaway there is like, if the, you're not sure about their involvement, you make sure that's clear in your justification about why you don't have partners. And you also clarify that in your narrative responses. Uh, and then the other thing that might throw some folks off if you haven't dug into the weeds of the guidelines and that section 2.2 and Brandon touched on it a moment ago in his overview about eligible activities, they are pulled from the 2020 California Adaptation Planning Guide. Um, there's also a lot of them listed in section 2.2 of the guidelines. Uh, so when you get to the work plan, the very last column it says, you know, it's a predetermined list drop down, and you're supposed to select which APG, APGP eligible activity that your task applies to, and you're choosing between phase one through phase four or program admin. <clears throat> Those phases refer back to this section 2.2 or the California Adaptation Planning Guide. So just keep that in mind. If you're like, what, which one am I supposed to choose? You would look at that. They're also a high level review of those in the reference tab, which is tab number five. Um, so what are considered program admin activities? I feel like there might be some questions on this at some point, if not today. Um, these are uh, activities that are related to your APGP deliverables, uh, but they don't actually fulfill the, the deliverable itself, but they're related and they help make those things happen, right? So grant reporting, evaluating the outcomes, invoicing, um, processing contracts, reviewing contracts that you might have with, whether that's with partners or a subcontractor, um, meeting preparation and follow-up. So like agendas, setting up event planning, that sort of thing. Uh, and this is taken directly from Appendix E in the um, guidelines. This is just how ICARP is gonna be reviewing your work plan and judging it for a score. These work plan uh, terms are highlighted because if you were to go at the guideline to the guidelines right now, this uh, it's on page 50 of the guide of, of the appendix E, which is page 50 in the guidelines. It actually says budget and I'm just pointing that out in case anybody sees it and it throws them off. It should say work plan. Not a big deal. I think y'all would have figured it out without me saying anything, but I wanted to, to make sure and flag it. It took me a few seconds. So some tips uh, before we walk away here is from the from the work plan, you know, develop your work plan with the reviewers in mind. Um, I said this already. This is a way for ICARP to, you know, format everybody's scope of work in a way that's easy to review, easy for them to understand what your priorities are and what your ultimate um, scope of work is broken down into individual tasks. Um, so you're clearly trying to show the reviewer that you understand the scope of work, you understand the priorities, and you're calling those key things out in the work plan. And, you know, be comprehensive. There's a column for your uh, each task description. You don't need to write like a chapter from a book, but just be clear and concise and use um, the terms that reflect what it is you are actually doing. 
and we're going to talk about the budgets. And I promise I'm going to share the actual uh, budget and work plan here at the end. So we have a visual on what we're talking about. <laughs> but similar to the work plan, the budget objectives uh, kind of are going after the same thing. Just trying to give a clear understanding of what your costs are in this case. Uh, that they connect back to the work plan. So there's ways that you can make a connection between each work plan activity and the budget activity, and we'll look at that closer in a bit. Uh, and also demonstrating that you have um, meaningful costs, which means like, does do these costs make sense for this activity? Have you? It's not going to ask you for the evidence of where you got the costs. You're not going to be able to do that, but you will have wanted to talk to some folks and we'll talk about estimating budgets in a little bit. Um, but that is part of the goal here is you're going to be indicating costs. And if they look, a they'll raise a red flag if they look a little high or low based on what you're doing. Um, and then also the budget's going to be a great way to show that you've allocated costs across your partners um, and doing it in an equitable way, playing to their strengths, involving them, including them in the in the whole project. And then don't forget to account for those costs that sometimes get forgotten about when you're developing your budget, which is the amount of time from staff, um, both direct and indirect expenses. So keep those in mind as well. And OPR has done a good job of pointing out in a couple places, and we I bring them up here a little bit later in the presentation about where you need to specifically maybe reserve some consider reserving some funds for some admin costs. Um, so uh, another consideration is ensuring that your costs are eligible. So some common reasons that uh, costs may not be um, eligible is they may not, uh, you know, they may not be awarded, excuse me, um, is because they just aren't eligible. They're not part of the eligible cost list. The 2.3 section of the guidelines goes into some great detail about eligible and ineligible costs. And there's going to be a slide later in here that also talks about them. Sorry, my Zoom screen is covering up my notes slide, so having trouble remembering the key things to say. Um, and then also, I think I've said this already, but just uh, considering how you're allocating your resources across um, your partners or co-applicants. And then here's one place that OPR did point out in Appendix G, that you could consider setting aside 15 up to 15 percent um, for peer-to-peer -peer learning um, and that's described a little bit more what that looks like in appendix g which is a post post award activities that they'll be doing and that includes these similar workshops to this but it'll be on different topic areas and more specific um, to climate adaptation generally Um, and then worth mentioning, for those of you that might be leveraging other funds with your APGP project, um, you will make sure, you will want to make sure these will not actually be shown in your budget or your work plan, um, but OPR has uh, mentioned it in the guidelines that they would like that to be described in a letter of support, um, including the timeline for securing that funding and how much that funding is um, expected to be. So if you're planning on having uh, some other private funding or um, public source funding, just make sure that you provide a letter of support or some sort of letter that documents um, when that funding is expected and how much, but it won't go in your actual APGP budget. Uh, so as promised, I also put the list of eligible costs in this slide deck and the presentation. These are also listed in the guidelines, and um, I believe it's 2.3. Uh, so these are all eligible costs, um, and they're broad because, as you um, have already seen, there's a lot of different act planning activities that would apply to any of these categories. You just want to be careful in that last one, indirect administrative costs. Um, you want to keep those under 20%. And when you look at the budget, you'll see, and we'll look at it together, but when you when you go into it, uh, they do keep track of that indirect um, category to make sure it doesn't go over 20. 
And here's a list of ineligible costs. Uh, I think it's where I won't read all of them, but um, worth pointing out uh, CEQA and NEPA related costs. Don't plan on using APGP funds to pay for uh, those reports um, and evaluations to, to meet the NEPA and CEQA requirements. And you also wouldn't want to um, plan on using these funds for any design and construction. Uh, and then there's a separate slide specifically for the community engagement because community engagement is is a very large piece of you know planning, and uh, ICARP wants to make sure that that's included in your scope of work and and work plan, and that you're um, working with vulnerable communities. It's important to note that there are some ineligible costs when it comes to community engagement. Uh, I think a main one that most people are familiar with: no alcoholic refreshments um, at your community events. And direct cash benefits or subsidies are also not allowed. However, it's important to note that compensation is allowed. You just want to make sure that that is framed and approached um, and justified correctly. And typically that means that there'll be some sort of work product that comes out of it. So you're asking the community to provide feedback or um, participate in a charrette that ends up with some deliverables at the end. Um, and that would be allowable. So it's all about how you're framing it and making sure that there's a service provided. Um, but incentives would also not be like door prizes um, would not be allowable. Uh, and then general meetings that don't have any um, discussion or advance your APA, APGP project. Um, so the budget template uh, is also going to have columns for unit costs and um, estimating out how much each of those unit costs are. And the reason to bring this up is because you will have different activities that may have different metrics for the unit cost, right? It might be a flat fee. Um, it might be an hourly rate. It might be a per item. You just want to be clear um, in your cost description that you indicate um, what the unit type is, especially if you have a bunch of different costs with various um, different unit types um, or yet yeah, unit metrics. Um, you, you want to point that out. And a flat fee is fine. Just want to make sure that you notate that. And then some common questions uh, for the budget that we hear about is, you know, just generally, what should I include in the budget? And how do I, you know, how do I know what to call it? Well, great news is that OPR kind of did that work for you, where you're going to um, indicate what type of cost it is. Um, it'll help clue you into what you're putting in the budget because it's a predetermined list. And we'll look at that in a moment as well, but you, you'll you get to that column, you'll use the drop down, and you'll be, I think it's like seven, maybe, maybe eight items that you select from. Um, and then you're including your own detailed description about what that cost type is, but um, it'll be pretty clear. Uh, and then how do I estimate costs? This is a big one. Estimating cost, I mean, a budget is is just what it sounds like, right? It's an estimate of your costs. It's not a guarantee, but you do want to do some due diligence to determine and get close. And that's what I meant earlier about being meaningful and reasonable about your costs. Um, if you really don't know what one of your activities is going to cost, you should probably talk to your partners that are involved, whether they're going to be co-applicants or just supporters. Um, you can also look to past projects that you may have done in other topic areas, but like a feasibility study is a good example. You might need a feasibility study for something uh, from APGP and you haven't done it before, but you've done a different feasibility study with similar uh, scope and scale, but not on the same topic, right? Um, you could look back to the cost for that um, and base, it wouldn't necessarily be exactly the same, but you can take inferences from that. Um, and uh, just considering you can also talk to contractors, especially if you have um, relationships with contractors already and they don't mind talking to you about like, you know, what would determine the costs and how you might estimate it. Um, that's helpful. Um, and then if it's really, really not obvious and you can't get to an answer, consider breaking down the activity into smaller pieces. And that sometimes helps get to an answer about estimating costs. And then you would have like maybe subtasks underneath your, 
main task and break it down that way. And like final note, I would say on this is not mentioned here. It's really good to keep track of how you estimated your costs. And that could be something as simple as, you know, you probably have a folder already on your desktop for APGP, throw in a document, um, just very informal and start tracking like, okay, feasibility study, talk to XYZ on such date. Um, and they told me this and it's a couple sentences just to help remind you in case you, uh, this comes up again, if, um, if, you know, you get into the final interviews and there's questions about the estimating a cost, you have something to reference and say how you, um, found that or determine that. Uh, and this is uh, similar to the work plan. There's a section in Appendix E that just gives you uh, an idea of what ICARP, how they're going to be judging the point system for your budget. So it might just be helpful to look at that sort of as you get further in. Uh, and then just some tips about your budgets, ensuring that um, each cost clearly corresponds back to the subtasks listed in your work plan. Uh, and something to consider and worth mentioning, it's not shown this way on the examples, but you could include the task and subtask code, and we'll look at this in a moment, um, in your budget cost description so that it directly ties back to your work plan. That might be a helpful way for you to keep track, and then it also is a helpful way for OPR to see exactly how your work plan ties into your budget. Just, just a suggestion, not a requirement. Uh, and just being specific in your cost description. So again, that's another way you could be specific is just tying it directly back to your work plan. And then we talked a lot about um, making sure that your costs are reasonable. So we're gonna do closer look at the workbook. We already talked about where you're gonna download it. Um, what I didn't mention and I'll mention now is um, making sure that once you download it, Make sure you save it, put it in that file that's probably on your desktop, on that folder, excuse me, um, and make sure it's set to auto save or do a lot of save as is. Um, in the end, you're gonna have to upload it back into Submittable once it's complete um, before you submit your whole application. And the blue box underneath is where you're gonna do that when you're ready. And you certainly don't wanna do that right away. You do that at the end. So I'm going to try to share and see if this works, the work plan. I think y'all should be able to see it. Um, let me know, Brandon, if you don't yep. see the, okay, great. Looks good. All right. So this is the actual um, workbook that's going to download for you. And these bottom tabs are what I did a screenshot of earlier in the first, one of the first slides. Um, and right now I'm on number one work plan and I'm just showing you cause I'm a visual learner um, as well, <laughs> or excuse me, I'm a visual learner. I don't know if you all are, but um, if you haven't seen this yet, then this is a great introduction and you won't be so maybe um, intimidated by it when you do open it. And if you have seen it, then let's just go over it again and you'll get more comfortable with it. Uh, you're entering everywhere that it says NA, you're going to um, fill it in with your proposal name, lead applicant, your project description, keep that short within 500 characters. This is not the place where you need to worry about, you know, having every detail in. You're going to do that in your narrative responses of the application. But then you're going to come down here and don't miss this part, right? You're going to insert like a broad overarching task one. And then you're going to be breaking down that, that broad task into subtasks. And then here are the prompts that I mentioned earlier. A really nice way to just remind you, this is where you're putting in the detail of your work plan. Um, and then your milestone, your deliverable. So for example, I mean, you could look at this example here, right? I've jumped over just now to the tab three, which is the example work plan. And ICARP has put in a great sort of various activities to give you an idea of what it could look like for any type of task or subtask. Um, an example that I kept, um, well, this is a good one. So 
task two, subtask A, the deliverable milestone. I think oftentimes we can overthink like what this deliverable milestone has to be. If it's a community event that you're convening, then the agenda and the notes and the outcome of that event, that's that's your milestone. That's your deliverable, right? Um, so I just wanted to mention that because you don't have to overthink it and think that it has to be anything bigger than what, uh, than what something that might be. Um, and then your timeline, which you want to keep uh, within before January 31st, 2027. And here's that partners involved column that I that I mentioned. And here's that eligible activities column that I mentioned. It's a predetermined dropdown list. And you see phase one, phase two, three, and four, and program admin. So you're going to pick from one of these five options. You don't have to go make up your own eligible activity term. I think that's really helpful. Um, while we're talking about this, I'm gonna show you the reference tab that I mentioned earlier, because those phases are listed here at the bottom. I just clicked over to the tab five, if for anyone that missed it. And I'm going up to the top. Basically this reference tab is referencing different um, fields, right, that are in the work plan or the budget. But if you scroll towards the bottom, adaptation planning phase is what is referring to that work plan eligible activities. And this is helpful, but I will mention I was looking at it closer and I realized it doesn't give you um, exact or specific ideas. It's kind of more generally describing what each phase has, which is great and it's helpful to have. But for anyone that hasn't dug deep yet and doesn't know exactly what eligible activity their um, project falls into, you would go back to the section 2.2 of the guidelines. And I think that would be more helpful. And then you determine from there. Because for example, like if you were doing a feasibility study, that's not specifically listed here. Some of you would realize, okay, that's gonna fit into phase four and that's where it does go. But in the guidelines, they actually list feasibility study in phase four, in case that's helpful. Let's see, make sure I, and the other point to mention, and I, I mentioned it already, but I'll say it again, is like, you might go in here this week and start filling in some things. You know what your scope is, you feel confident, you've got task one and task two, um, you fill it out, you feel like you're in a good place. And then you might be going back to your narrative response is in the application and add something like a community event or you, oh, all of a sudden you have a partner confirmed and they're gonna do X, Y, Z. So then you would go back into this work plan and you would add that subtask. You don't have to have it all figured out before you start is I guess my point and the takeaway. All right. Going back here, I think, um, yeah, the next thing I wanted to just go through on the workbook is the budget itself. And if I didn't point out anything, if I didn't point this out already, you know, you've got some handy instructions at the top. Don't ignore them. They're good reminders. One thing um, that is in the instructions and that I wanted to mention is that anything shaded in gray is a formula cell. So column L, let me delete this, um, and column E, and then these boxes here where you're talking about direct and indirect costs, don't you don't need to fill those out and you should not fill them out because it'll mess up the calculations for OPR when they're doing it. And they have some triggers set so that if you go over, <coughs> excuse me, um, for example, if your indirect costs uh, go over 20% up here, this will turn red. Um, and also uh, like they tell you in the instructions, um, column L will turn red. Uh, if your sum of the tasks are different than the cost per unit times the number of units. So there's little there's little flags that are going to pop up if if things go over a certain amount. Um, but just backing up to the beginning, you do not need to do a description on the budget. You're just doing the proposal name, lead applicant, not filling anything in here. This is going to auto calculate based on what you select here and what you fill in here. Um, so your cost description is not a drop down. That's where you could go back. This is where I was talking about. You could go back to the work plan and choose task 1A. You could put here 
and then put the title of the name there. You do the cost type, which is a predetermined dropdown. Which one does it fit into? Let's say it's evaluation activities and then the cost per unit. Let's um, say it's uh, you know a flat rate of $600 and it's just one unit because it's one evaluation report. Let's just say, I'm just making it up. See how it uh, the formula automatically populates to the right. Um, and then these task uh, titles actually correspond to task one, task two, task three in your work plan. So that's another way that they're making the connection between the budget and the work plan. So this might be broken down um, into smaller, the 600 might be broken down into smaller pieces, or it may just be under task one and one time. It doesn't have to be spread out. Uh, and same goes with your budget as your work plan. You know, you'll come back to it. It's an iterative process until you're finished with the application. Um, and then it all gets uploaded together um, with the workbook uh, when you're ready through that download or that upload box that I showed you a few slides ago. And I think that was all I wanted to mention about the budget and the work plan, but I'm happy to take questions. And I'm sorry if there's been stuff coming over in chat. I have not been able to watch both that and the presentation. Great. Thanks, Lois. Yeah. Looks like we only had one question come through. Um, is it okay to reorder subtasks and add more lines? Um, I would say yes. It's a, a template to be used and adjusted <clears throat> as you see fit, however best represents your, your project. I would just sort of, as Lois had just mentioned, um, kind of steer clear of adjusting any of those cells that have preloaded formulas, which we rely on on the program end of things to um, help make sure that budgets are sort of in compliance with the guidelines. Um, yeah, we can take a quick Q&A. So it looks like Stephen has his hand raised. I would recommend if folks want to um, ask a question, uh, feel free to raise your hand or put it in the chat and we'll call on names as uh, as they come through. So uh, Stephen, feel free to come off mute. Yeah, hi, my name is Stephen Decatur. I'm with the city of Dunsmere. Um, I had a question about the timeline um, for activities. It's a 24 month period, but if we wanted to do like if we're bringing on a contractor and we wanted to do the RFP process before the awards officially hit, is that okay to put in the work plan? Um, or is that something that we need to wait for the, the award to actually hit? Yeah, we would need to wait for the award to, to for, for the contract to be signed, essentially. Um, we cannot yeah. sort of retroactively reimburse. But, no, yeah, yeah. But if we wanted to do like, put out an RFP and do that process before the contract is signed. Is that something that we could do? Yes. Uh, yes. Assuming you are funded project or, you know, if, if you wanted to use the APGP grants funding and you were maybe awarded, you could go ahead and, and do that. That would be great. If you had some other type of funding um, and wanted to commence the RFP process anyways, that's also fine. Um, okay. Um, and, and then, uh, oh, sorry. No, I was going to say to Stephen, I think you would want to, and Brandon, correct me if I'm wrong, but you could show that on their work plan, the timeline, right? Even though it's going to happen before yes. they're awarded. I mm -hmm. think you would want to see that they're doing an RFP and you would show that in your timeline. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, that's how, that's how I have it currently, but I just wanted to make sure that that was okay to do because we're not, This my second question here is um, we're not like asking for any admin cost um, per se, or we don't need them. We can ask if if that's something that you'd like us to do, but we don't really need them. So like, especially with like the RFP, there's nothing, we're not gonna, we don't want reimbursement for any of our time to do that. Um, so I just, I guess, is that okay if we're not asking for admin cost? Um, like my position's grant funded already. So my position can't be reimbursed anyway. Yeah, that makes, that makes sense to me. That's All right, thank you. leveraging other funds, so you're good. I think that's fine. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. 
We have another question um, from Tiff West in the chat. Um, when should we assume project start date to be, please? Um, we're going to be announcing awards this summer, probably um, July. And from our experience last year, the contract process took from six to nine or 10 months um, for many folks it, it took it took quite a while um for approvals to come through from different folks um especially if there are sort of like arduous uh, city council timelines or you know elections you know that that go on um, that slow things down so um, you're looking to begin really you know six to nine months after july if you're awarded um is my sort of ballpark estimate just from seeing what we saw last year. Hopefully that answers your question, Tiff, and feel free to come off mute if you have a follow-up or, or put a follow-up question in the chat. I think from our perspective, we would hope, folk, we, we wish folks could start, you know, the day that they're awarded, but that's, uh, not always the case. Any other questions? Feel free if you don't want to come off mute to put the question in the chat. Go ahead and stop the recording.